Welcome back to another segment of Behind the Scenes of the Waltons, as I take more of your questions in a segment of Ask Judy. I also had a message recently that I thought was very sweet in response to the recent passing of Tom Bauer and then looking back at a number of people and cast members that we have lost. So it was just, it really moved me. So I thought I would share it with you and thank you for the message. Uh, C.S. Roethlisberger, who said, I think up in heaven, there's the Walton's kitchen table and all those who have passed are sitting around it, chatting and laughing, telling stories, etc. Do you remember the time I went to the studio up in Fraser Park one time? I did a movie at Fox back in the day and so forth. There's Ralph at the head of the table with Will at the other end, with Ellen next to Will grasping his hand. I see Ike and Corbeth on one side with the Baldwin ladies next to them. On the other side of the table is Richard Gilliland and Morgan Stevens, who are waving someone to the table to join in on the fun. It's Tom. He goes over and sits next to Richard and Morgan and all have huge grins on their faces. Tom shakes hands with the two as he maneuvers his legs into position in order to sit down on the bench at the table. All are greeting him and welcoming him. He is so happy as everyone is so joyful. I can hear Will laughing boisterously. Everyone is talking at once. It's hard to hear what's being said over the din. How wonderful and joyful. That really, that really is sweet. When I first read that, it really moved me and it still does to think of all these wonderful people and tremendous actors that we had the pleasure to work with over the years who are now gone. And so nice to think of them all celebrating together and sharing their memories of their time on the Waltons, their time in Hollywood, and all that we shared together in real life. So thank you for that very touching message, and I hope that all of you appreciated it also. This question from Tony Dale Wanamaker, who said, I am curious, what was the longest time period you and the rest of the cast actually had to stay on the set, or did you have set hours? Um, it varied. Uh, there are union rules on how many hours actors can be asked to work before they get into penalties and meal penalties and overtime and things like that. And then there is a mandatory for actors 12 hour turnaround between what time you were let go uh, the day before to what time they can call you the next day. Uh, and union, the crew has those kinds of, of um, hour restrictions as well about penalties and things like that. So it gets very expensive for a company to keep working longer and longer hours, but they'll do it under necessary circumstances if they have to finish out a set and they can't get the set again. So, uh, but they really try not to get into overtime and stuff because it just kills the budget. But uh, for me, I think on the Waltons, the longest I worked was I think 16 hours on the grandchild when I had been filming all day and then it was a Friday night and we were going to film the sequences where Mary Ellen's running through the woods at night uh, and it's raining and it's lightning and you know Kurt's looking for me. Uh, so that I ended up working till, I don't know, midnight, I don't remember, 10, 12, something like that, but it was a 16 hour day for me. Uh, but they'll do it on a Friday because then they don't have the mandatory 12 hour turnaround to worry about because we didn't work Saturday or Sunday. Uh, typically uh, our call times, our shoot call times were about eight or 8.30 in the morning. So then you back that up on what is hair and makeup time. But that's if we were at the studio, if we were gonna be going on location, then those would often start earlier. So <clears throat> typically our shoot days were eight to eight to eight or something like that or 7.30 to 7.30 or something like that. Uh, if we were outside, because this is kind of what you're talking about, many times the cast were actually filming in darkness at night or would appear to be dark. Um, some, it was a little of both. Sometimes if we were in an area that they could control the light a bit, they would shoot what we call day for night. So they were shooting during the day and making it look like it was night. Uh, Ralph Sinensky has talked about that uh, on an episode like The Chicken Thief, where he said they actually were shooting during the day 
and it was they were able to shoot some of those night sequences where people were uh, bringing chickens <laughs> to uh, return to that uh, the man that that uh, Yancey was accused of having stolen chickens from. Uh, and so there were things like that that uh, that would be done, and sometimes it's very obvious that they were shooting in the day because you can see sunlight in the distance, or it just doesn't look realistic. Uh, so they would do that sometimes because they had to. Uh, sometimes the light's easier to control than other times. Sometimes if you're shooting, say, on the porch, where the porch kind of keeps the sun from being as evident, you could do that. But sometimes, like when we shot the burnout, we definitely shot at night. That was, again, a Friday night when we shot. Uh, so in that case... Uh, we could go later because they they really needed that to be dark when the house was burning. Um, so it varied. In that case, we probably started a bit later in the day. So that's what they'll do if they really need to shoot something at night. They will just start later or they will do it on a Friday so that they can just do longer hours. Uh, but that's kind of how productions work with that. Sometimes uh, some of you viewers will share information with me that's more detailed in answer to a question or something that happened in an episode or something in one of my segments. In this case, John Pinckney shared information about ham radios in regards to the episode, The Children's Carol. Uh, and he said, "There's um, it's a great episode, despite having serious flaws with historic accuracy. As I mentioned in an earlier note, after World War II started on September 1st, 1939, the UK shut down all British hams for the duration of the war. Likewise, the FCC in the US invoked little used ITU regulation forbidding US hams to communicate with hams in other nations. A question about that rule is still on the FCC test to earn the technician's class amateur radio license. US hams were largely allowed to remain on the air otherwise. No portable operation, for example, except for ARRL field day until the Pearl Harbor attack. U.S. hams were immediately silenced with W1AW allowed to continue for a few days to transmit warnings bulletins to hams who may not have gotten the word. Ham radio didn't come back in the U.S. for some months after the end of the war. Shortwave bands were restored gradually and the FHF bands were rearranged. 73. Thank you very much for that information. Thank you once again for joining me for this segment of Ask Judy. I will see you next time for more behind the scenes of the Waltons and more Ask Judy. And I've got some more special guests coming up too. Thanks for watching.